Uh, next paper is presented from Germany, two universities, Marburg and Darmstadt, also Netflix is behind this paper. Uh, I allow two presenters this time. Um, so we have both Jonas and Arthur presenting. Learning Wi-Fi connection loss predictions for seamless vertical handovers using multipath TCP. Please join me in welcoming Jonas and Arthur on stage. So uh, thank you everybody for the warm welcome. So as already mentioned, this is joint work from two universities. And uh, to start over, I'd like to think of a situation. In the morning where you wake up, you maybe have a phone call using voice over IP, plug in your headphones, leave your home, and ah, the connection stops. You have to re-phone to get uh, the connection running again, and user interaction is always a bad in terms of quality of experience. And also, the one Netflix guy we have over here uh, is working on that. So um, we are trying to make better quality of experience with this paper. So smartphones are our daily companions. We use them for communication, as uh, proposed beforehand, uh, with voice over IP. We use them for information and for uh, getting things we want to know, and also for entertainment, which is uh, quite popular right now. Um, we have multiple radio access technologies, uh, Wi-Fi and cellular, of course, LTE and 3G, and as we heard in the keynote today, 5G is just upcoming, uh, and we tend to need handovers between those different connectivity modes. And we think handovers are not solved yet. So today, handovers are perf performed reactively, especially uh, the operating systems used today measure uh, based on weak RSSI or high packet losses uh, when they think a connection might not work anymore. Uh, then they change the default gateway uh, in classical IP routing. Um, the application then has to deal with this connection loss. So the application uh, has to build up a new TCP flow and manage all the things to do the transition between uh, these two radio access technologies. With multipath TCP, we have some kind of a solution for that. So we use multiple subflows, flows, uh, which can uh, have one connection over those multiple subflows that are available today. The drawbacks here are that all the interfaces have to be online all the time, so we have a higher energy usage. Uh, and also in the case, especially the Germans will know, with uh, costly data plans, uh, we maybe not want to use uh, our LTE connection for all the time. So our approach is based on uh, data-driven, uh, and also we are approaching uh, the problem with a proactive approach. So we want to predict when we will lose the Wi-Fi and then do a seamless vertical handover. For this, we use multiple heterogeneous smartphone sensor data to predict when we are actually going to lose the Wi-Fi connection. And then we will use multipath TCP for the actual connection handover, so building up subflows there. Um, and we did an experimental evaluation of the quality ex of experience, so the, uh, the quality that is perceived by the user. And we have an open demo implementation and the experimental artifacts available. So um, what I'm going to tell you now is about first about the sensor readings, so some glimpse of what sensor readings we have available on smartphones today. We'll skip online prediction, and Arthur is telling us something about it later on. Uh, we'll talk about the data we collected during the paper and what we think we can achieve with it. We're then talking about feature selection, so which features should we actually use uh, to predict something like that. We'll talk about the machine learning, how we designed our machine learning model. And in the end, we uh, talk about how to evaluate such a model. And then we come back to the mobile application. So, smartphone sensor readings. Um, this one example is the linear acceleration sensor, which basically is a good indicator for user movement. So if you walk along here, you can measure that really good by linear acceleration. Spatial orientation seems a bit related to that, uh, but we can detect other things. For example, a phone that is lying flat on the table. With the power state, we can investigate things like if we are charging, and if we are charging, it seems 
uh, rather not that high that we move away in the next seconds. Um, and the last one, uh, atmospheric pressure, uh, can be used to detect whether we change uh, the height. So, for example, changing levels in a building can be detected really good by that. Uh, we have one uh, example here, and we will come back to that later on. Uh, we see the Wi-Fi RSSI, which is um, from the Wi-Fi connection, uh, and the phi speed. Uh, here's the pressure. Um, which is going up here. So if you move down in a building, the pressure tends to go up. Then we have the uh, acceleration length. So that's the three uh, vectors, the, the three part vector combined here. Uh, we have steps per second. You see uh, some spikes here, which is due to the sampling rate uh, of the sensor and the gravity of the z-axis, which is also an indicator for lying flat on the table. And uh, later on, we will come to the ground truth and to the prediction we did. The data we collected during that paper uh, consists of 20 gigabytes um, from five different users. And we told them to let the application run for the whole day so that we get actual data from daily lives of users and not some artificial data collected just in the lab. We came up with 900,000 unique samples collected across three months. And we split them up. Um, how, that's how you do it in machine learning, uh, to a training and test set, uh, but in two variants. The first one is by randomly splitting, so taking all the data together, and randomly splitting 70% for learning and 30% for testing. And the second uh, uh, way we came up to split the data is user-based. So we learned our model by taking data from four users and evaluated against the fifth user, so we can test how good we are able to generalize across uh, different users. Um, so this is an example with artificial data that's not really collected data, and two sensors in this case. Um, so I would like to talk briefly about how to do predictions with machine learning. Um, for our case, we selected an observation window, in this example, 60 seconds, uh, and we take all the sensor readings we have, um, so in this case, two sensors, for an observation window of 60 seconds. So in this case, uh, 120 uh, features would be available for every prediction. And then we also um, created a prediction window, in this case, 15 seconds, where we have a look ahead as a crown truth. So uh, from the time of the prediction here at T0, uh, we would look for the learning phase 15 seconds ahead. And if the Wi-Fi would get lost in the next 15 seconds, we would classify that uh, as a Wi-Fi loss, and we would like to predict that. OK. Two, <clears throat> two feature vectors we created. The first one is just taking all the sensors we have available in the, uh, in the smartphone that are currently 25, um, at least for our data set, um, which results in the, uh, with the observation window of 60 seconds in 1,500 uh, features. And then uh, by extensive experiments, we came up with a second uh, feature vector, the reduced feature vector, uh, which is just a combination of the most uh, relevant features here. And this is a little uh, smaller. It's 480 features. And the thing here is we really want to have some energy efficiency here. Uh, and we do not want to just blindly put all the sensors in. Uh, the ground truth was computed by the Wi-Fi RSSI, shifted a little bit, because the Android Wi-Fi API is really not that reactive. OK, so to, to test uh, whether our approach is working, we did uh, a first glimpse using a random forest classifier, uh, which is really common out there. It's fast, it's used by many people, uh, and it works. Um, we came up with overall uh, promising and good results. But if you look here at the loss precision class, uh, you might see some problems. So the actual task of our paper, to remind you, was to uh, not have unnecessary handovers and to not have the LTE, for example, uh, available for too long. So we can uh, have lesser energy usage. And this loss precision class is actually the target we want to, uh, want to uh, target with our, with our approach. So this is not, not the best result in this case. So we came up with, a, with another approach, um, neural networks. They're popular, and also they uh, work quite well for uh, more abstract tasks task of classification. 
Um, the input layer is again the same, and we came up with uh, three different configurations uh, of neural networks. The one is uh, the first is consisting of one hidden layer, the second of three hidden layers, and the third of four hidden layers. And the output is then uh, the loss probability. Uh, with this layout, we got um, better. So this is the overall um, quality we were able to achieve. Uh, as you see here, the forest is at 0 0.89 as before. Um, and with the neural networks, we got really better in the, in the loss precision class. The recall is a little worse, so we have some uh, handovers we do not uh, get that well. But uh, for, for the actual loss precision class, we get way better. OK, coming back to our example. Um, as I told you before, the crown truth here is uh, predicted by looking into the future, basically. Uh, and then the blue line is the prediction we did with our model. Um, if anyone can see from the features here that we will lose the Wi-Fi basically here, uh, that would be really good, because we have no uh, no way uh, as, a, as a user or as a, as a human here to tell that we will lose the Wi-Fi. And uh, with our model, we really get uh, this on point, and we already see that we will lose the Wi-Fi and then can trigger some uh, events. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand over to Arthur, who is giving a talk about the demo app and the evaluation we did. OK. So um, to evaluate our approach, we built an Android application, which consists of uh, three parts. Um, the first one is the on-device model execution. So we took our trained uh, models, uh, transpiled them to Java code, and then to Dalvik uh, bytecode to have a somewhat uh, efficient execution of the trained models, um, and implemented them in, in our Android application. And then we have on the upper half um, a, a video playing back, which, is, which we used uh, for visualizing uh, the quality of experience. So with video, you can quite good see if the quality is changing, if the video stops to play, and so on. So you have a pretty good uh, yeah, visual effect there. And um, the uh, handovers are actually done with multi-path TCP. So uh, coming back to the video, we used the Dash uh, technologies. Um, which is quite used nowadays. So we have basically three available uh, qualities here. And the video is split into segments of two seconds, and ev which means we can uh, s uh, change the quality of the video every two, two seconds. Um, we use the Bowler adaptation algorithm, which is based on the round trip time. Uh, so the, the, yeah, it's based on the round trip time. And um, we um, have quite a lot of base metrics here for the evaluation later on. So we uh, count how often the video stalls and how, how long the stall events are. Um, then we have the, the bitrate uh, locked, which uh, tells us the quality we are currently delivering the video, and the number of adaptations. So how often do we change the quality of the video? And we use the, the Open Movie Elephant Stream. It's from the Blender Foundation. Uh, yeah, it's free and open. Uh, this is why we used it. So how does the, the actual handover um, work? We built an uh, Android kernel uh, with multipath TCP enabled, deployed it to our phone. And then when our prediction tells us we will lose the Wi-Fi within the next 15 seconds, we will turn on the LTE data and let the multipath control app, which is uh, uh, prior, uh, prior work from Deconic and all, um, this app then handles all the uh, uh, subflow uh, build-up and route settings and so on. Um, and everything else below that is done by the multipath TCP kernel without further involvement from us. The video server obviously is also to support multipath TCP. Uh, we use the redundant scheduler at this point to have uh, for two reasons. First, we want to have all data on all possible subflows. Um, to not have some the <coughs> sorry, to not have the multipath TCP scheduler reroute some data, so every, all data is available everywhere. And the second reason is uh, we want we later conduct some multipath TCP only tests, and we, uh, when we have all data, all video data available on all subpaths, subflows, um, we can achieve the highest possible um, video quality in our setup. So we get a um, 
a best case benchmark when we use the redundant scheduler. And with a, a full mesh path manager, uh, we build up subflows as soon as another interface is available without further waiting time or something. As soon as it's available, another subflow is built up to speed up uh, the handover. Um, we uh, made uh, quite a lot of experience. Um, we have four scenarios here. The first one you can see in blue uh, on the map is basically the, the scenario Jonas told you in the very beginning. So it's uh, basically me leaving the office, losing Wi-Fi, and uh, um, I have to trigger the proactive uh, transition to LTE. <coughs> the second scenario, visiting a colleague, is this orange little path here. You can't, maybe can't see it. Um, this is, again, me leaving the office, but this time I will stay within the Wi-Fi range, and the quality of the connection is still very good. Uh, we wanted, wanted to try how, ma how many false positives we trigger with, with such a situation. The, th the third scenario is the green one. We change the, the level of the building uh, for two reasons. First, we want uh, to incorporate a little more sensors than just uh, walking around, so we have the a uh, pressure sensor here involved also, for example. And the second reason is uh, we still stay within the Wi-Fi range, but this time the quality is very bad of the Wi-Fi connection, so that Android thinks we are still connected to Wi-Fi, but we can't get any data through. So we want also to avoid these situations with our approach. And the fourth one, um, you can see our university building here, and these little circles are Wi-Fi access points from, from our university. And um, if you walk along the, the hallways, you have to do a lot of uh, handovers within Wi-Fi access points. And you have a, a lot of changing situations there, so sometimes you lose Wi-Fi at all, sometimes it's just bad. Um, yeah, we want to just have a look at how good we can handle uh, such situations. Then we had three connectivity modes, Android stock, so no multi-path, no handover whatsoever involved, just Android as it is today. Um, then multipath TCP only. That means we have two subflows over Wi-Fi and LTE all the time, for for the uh, as I told for the best case benchmark, and then of course our seamless approach. Um, because we used multipath TCP on a smartphone, there are quite a lot of restrictions. This is why we had uh, to use Android 4 at this point. But we did uh, of course um, tests with more recent Android versions as well and with the same results. So the results I will present you in a second are the same for recent Android versions, so there was no progress at all in this field. Okay, before I talk to you about results, uh, we want to give you a, l a little demo. Uh, this is the point, or to get the phone screen on the projector, we, use, we have to have some wireless connection. But the goal of our demo is to lose a wireless connection, so we have a little contradictory here. That's why <coughs> it's uh, the opportunity to grab your smartphones, download the slides, and click on the link. Just kidding. We have recorded a video for you. Um, this is basically me. The, for the first scenario, you will see me walking down the hallways in our university building. Um, on the left, this is stock Android. And on the right is our seamless connectivity approach. Then again, the video on the upper part. And down below, you can see the uh, visualization of the prediction. When we are at 1, that means we won't lose Wi-Fi. If the prediction drops down to 0, uh, this indicates we will lose Wi-Fi within the next 15 seconds. And the threshold we choose here is 50%. So if the prediction goes below 50%, we trigger the handover. Uh, a final remark, the y-axis is not fixed here. So you can see it's everything about 99% here. Uh, but this will change as we go uh, down the way. So then let's start the video. Uh, yeah, you can see me sitting at my desk. The video starts uh, playing back. You can see here multipath TCP was disabled at this point because we won't lose the Wi-Fi. Um, now I start walking around. The prediction is still 99%. But as I move uh, further away and start to shake the phone and so on, um, the prediction drops a little bit. And now after 15 meters around, we triggered here the, the handover and suggested the handover on this side. So we predicted we lose the Wi-Fi and did the handover. Now you want, can see 
on the left over here. Give it one more second. The video stops. Even if Android thinks we are still connected to Wi-Fi, the video stopped. So with our approach, we totally avoided this gap at this point. So this shows that our approach works quite well. Um, what does it mean in numerical values? <coughs> Again, we have our four scenarios here. Um, the first one, leaving the office, you can see that stock Android, as you saw in the video, stalled. So the video just stops playing for around 1.5 seconds on average. With multipath TCP and seamless, we totally avoid this gap, as you saw in the video. And with our approach, we reduce the data transmitted over, uh, transmitted over, oh, there's a question mark. This is wrong. Uh, this, is, this should be an average here. So we transmitted the data transmitted over LTE. Scenario two, triggering false positives, uh, indicates those st we do, do not introduce any negative effect here. There were no stalls. There were quite a good 90% uh, of the time in the highest quality, and we did not introduce any negativity here. <coughs> Using the staircase, on the other hand, stock Android again performs really bad here. So if you uh, have a really bad uh, Wi-Fi connection, Android won't detect this and just think, yeah, use the Wi-Fi. Why should I use LTE at this point? And with multipart TCP and seamless, again, we avoid this. And this time, even with our seamless approach, we can reduce the amount transmitted over Wi-Fi, uh, over LTE, sorry, uh, by up about 50%. So a major improvement here. And in the Wi-Fi roaming support, you can see uh, stock Android is about 50% of the time in the highest achieved quality. And with uh, multipath TCP and seamless, we can increase this to 84, 86%, while still using way less uh, data over LTE. But what does this mean to the user? So we, we are talking about quality experience, right? Um, therefore, we, could, uh, we used this, this raw metrics uh, for uh, mean opinion score evaluation. The mean opinion score is basically a numerical value, or it's a formula, where all this raw data is fed in, and it yields uh, a numerical value, which tells how good the user perceives uh, in this case, the video. Uh, the higher the number, the better the results are. So you can see in the fourth scenario, um, well, we are slightly better than stock Android, but cannot uh, totally cope with the situation. Um, this has basically uh, mainly one reason. Um, with a lot of changes, a lot of handovers from Wi-Fi to LTE and back to Wi-Fi and to LTE and so on, um, we have to tear down the LTE connection even before it's set up. So there, the multipath TCP scheduler can, cannot uh, build up the, the subflows in time. E uh, and uh, the more because we are walking uh, around in a building where the LTE connection was OK, but not very good. When we look uh, at scenario one and three, then you can see that we totally uh, outplay uh, stock Android, and we are on par with multipath TCP. So we can uh, increase the quality of experience by the user significantly while still using less, up to 50% less uh, LTE data over LTE. With this, I want to conclude our talk. So we showed you a novel and data-driven approach um, for Wi-Fi loss prediction. And with a precision of uh, up to 97%, and a recall of 98%, we had a quite good result there. <coughs> and our uh, implementation uh, showed the feasibility of our approach. Um, we, we could increase the quality of experience for the user significantly and reduce the uh, uh, data usage over LTE. Of course, there is uh, further uh, future work. So as you saw in scenario four, we can improve the situation, but not totally solve it yet. Um, but this could be done, we think, is, uh, with contextual sensors and domain-specific sensors. For example, detect high network load. <coughs> or in scenario for example, we could use the, uh, the GPS to detect if we are within a building uh, and to, to, to decide if it makes any sense to use LTE at this point. Um, then, of course, online learning on smartphones. So, so adjust your model on the smartphone live. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and you have specific uh, models, for example, for users or for user per access point he's connected to to get better results. Um, 
Then when you think towards 5G, like in the, in the talk, in the keynote this morning, then we'll, we will have probably a lot of handovers in the future from various radio access technologies, Wi-Fi, LTE, and what 5G will bring us. Um, and for, for more efficient, every, now everything is built into the Android application. Uh, this can be done, obviously, in a more uh, efficient way. So we had pre uh, previous work um, where we used complex event processing to uh, on different co-processes on the, on the smartphone to get really uh, energy efficient sensor readings and sensor reading evaluations. So uh, we don't stop there. Now the paper is quite well, but um, we make uh, everything publicly available. Available. We have set up a homepage. You can you can visit, and there you can find uh, everything from the paper to more details about how we how we did the experiments. Um, all our machine learning Jupyter notebooks are available in the Docker container, so you just fire up the Docker container and reproduce all our uh, experiments and, and results. And we have all the guides available to, for you to set up your own test, test bed. So just follow our guides and you can reproduce all of our experiments or even base your further research on, on our work. So, and with... With this, I want to thank you, and we are open for your questions. Thank you. We have maybe time for one or two questions. People are eager to have lunch, but we take two questions. Um, the quick transport protocol provides also the opportunity for seamless connection migration. Did you consider comparing to the, uh, their approach? Uh, at the point of writing this paper, the um, Quick was obviously available, but the multi-path Quick implementation for really hand, uh, seamless handovers was not under on the. Uh, there were glimpses about, but not in usable state. But you're totally true. This maybe is also a way to not uh, have to compile your own uh, kernel, but deploy it in, in the application, for example, as we heard yesterday in the keynote uh, for extensible networks. So Quick is a real good uh, addition to this. Uh, also, the machine learning approach here is not uh, tied in any way to multipath TCP, but it's generic and can, of course, be uh, used in combination with, with Quick. Good. We have C2 hands. Nils? I just, I just have a quick question. So, in some Android versions, there's also an option called aggressive Wi Fi to seller handover. Have you switched this on in your evaluation? Or is this, how, how would this change for uh, the stock Android results? Yeah, that's a very good question, and uh, it was turned on during the, no, it was turned off actually during the experiments because this uh, version, uh, this feature is introduced in Android 8 or something, or 7 maybe. Um, but the approach they have is, is still the same. Aggressive means we don't wait until the RSSI is at minus uh, 70, but minus, uh, I don't know, 60 maybe or something. Um, they get a little bit better, but still we, we, we had this uh, stalling events and uh, a lot of adaptations and so on. So they have improved this, but not that much. Yeah. One final here. Thank you, for, thank you for presenting your very interesting work. I just had a couple of questions about the performance issues that you were mentioning. So yes, you have improvement in terms of the handover and uh, you know, video quality, but did you consider the processing overhead and how much drainage on the battery that might have? And the second part of my question is uh, looking at the, uh, uh, you know, the neural network that you've been developing and you know, how much that might consume. Did you look back and just figure out the features that are you know, the most significant and just try to have deterministic thresholds just to have this you know, more, um, you know, more efficient? Uh, so the, the neural network implementation is uh, really not designed for efficiency here. We use the transpiler and com compile it to Java and then compile it down to uh, Dalvik bytecode. We can get much better here with the approaches uh, we have going to the sensor hub and uh, doing parts of the machine learning there and uh, also part of the application of the model there. Um, but it's not just not tuned for that uh, in this state of the work. Um, we have some done some analysis on power consumption. Uh, you, I think you can elaborate. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, here you can see we, we, we did this just for curiosity for, for us. It's not in the paper. <coughs> Uh, on the, the, so on the x-axis you can see uh, the time, and on the y-axis you can see the, the consumed energy, the uh, consumed power. Uh, the, green, the green line is Wi-Fi only, so we, no multipath, no handover, nothing. Uh, blue is um, multipath TCP and overall uh, interfaces all the time. And the orange one is um, our approach, basically. And as you can see, obviously, we introduced quite a lot of uh, Overhead here, it's about 50% and 15% in average. Um, at the beginning, Wi-Fi and LTE were both enabled. Uh, and here, LTE is disabled. This, this part is where the LTE has to, to be turned down, the connection has to be uh, broken up, and so on. Uh, and you can see we have a lot of, of possibilities here to save, actually, energy. So we, when we can get to an uh, energy-efficient implementation, which is not done entirely in the Android app, but on, in the kernel and maybe down uh, even even further down on the layers, then we have the possibility to to actually save energy here because we can turn down the LTE proactively and uh, if we don't need it. Yeah. Good. So by that we thank the, um, uh, all the speakers for this uh, session. Thank you.